Good evening. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this CSC Partners Roadmap 201 meeting, integrating clinician, researcher, and patient perspectives in the development of a PROM for PSC. My name is Mary Vias, and I'm the president of PSC Partners, Seeking a Cure Canada, and a mom to a young adult living with PSC. This evening's meeting will have two parts, a general session with three presentations, followed by moderated breakout rooms. Next slide, please. In May, we held a kickoff meeting, sorry, um, to introduce our roadmap series. Before we get started tonight, let's take a few moments to revisit what the roadmap initiative is all about. June 2 through 5, 2022 is the next PSC Partners Patient Conference to be held in Boston. This conference will be different from past conferences. In addition to the traditional patient community, education, and peer support, the meeting will also feature the launch of the PSC Partners Organized International Collaborative Research Network. These roadmap webinars are intended to prepare the PSC community to be active participants at the meeting and to make the most of the incredibly valuable opportunity to have so many of us researchers and patients physically together. Roadmap is one outcome of work that has been ongoing over the past few years. This includes the CZI Rare is One collaborative experience. A primary goal of this CZI grant is to leverage the power of patients to accelerate PSC research, including the development of a patient organized collaborative research network. The October 2020 externally led patient focused drug development form with the FDA, elevating the direct expression of PSC patient experience to decision makers in drug development. And the PSC partners patient registry, which currently has over 1900 participants from around the world who have demonstrated their commitment to engage in research. Together, these have led to an expanded vision of the role of PSC partners and the PSC community in research and drug development. Next slide, please. With that bit of context, the goals of Roadmap are accelerating progress to find therapies and a cure by one, educating the patient community on the research landscape, two, broadening the researcher base and strengthening multi-stakeholder communication, and three, creating opportunities for researchers and clinicians to engage in meaningful discussions with an informed patient community. Next slide, please. Practically, what does this look like? Well, we'll be hosting these series of roadmap meetings over the coming year with five major topic areas. There will be two Zoom meetings for each topic. The first will be a 101 session, meaning it's community focused, introductory, and then a 201 session, which will be a multi-stakeholder discussion. Today is a 201 session on patient reported outcome measures. If you missed earlier sessions, videos of previous roadmap meetings, as well as the PFDD recording are available and links can be found on the PSC Partners website at pscpartners.org. Next slide, please. Thank you so much for joining us. And again, welcome. Now I will pass the mic to Ricky Safer, founder and CEO of PSC Partners Seeking a Cure. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Mary, and thank you to all our attendees. We have a wonderful program tonight following up on our June webinar where PSC patients and caregivers shared their experiences living with various PSC symptoms as a beginning step and the, as the, in the creation of our PSC patient reported outcome measure, PROM. Here is today's agenda. Dr. Ruth Ann Pai, Director of Research Strategy here at PSC Partners Seeking a Cure, will discuss Let's Talk PSC Symptoms, Learnings from the Roadmap 101 Breakout Rooms. Next, Dr. Donna Yvonne will speak on a deeper dive into qualitative research methods for developing PRO measures for PSC, followed by Dr. Bryce Reeve speaking about the attributes of a patient reported outcome measure for use in PSC research studies. After this general session, all attendees will be moved into breakout rooms. The breakout room discussions will cover the use of PROMs in clinical trials 
clinical practice, or research. The goal in tonight's breakout rooms is to bring together the voices of PSCers, caregivers, clinicians, and researchers to foster open discussions on the uses and benefits of PROMS. We hope that everyone will share their perspectives. After the breakout sessions are over, please stay on for our brief wrap up with information about future events. Now I'm excited to introduce Dr. Ruth Ann Pai, PSC Partners Director of Research Strategy. Dr. Pai has a PhD in immunology from the University of Pennsylvania. At PSC Partners, we feel really lucky that she decided to join our patient organization to guide us in our scientific endeavors. Dr. Pai has analyzed the patient symptom discussion comments from our June webinar, and she has a fascinating presentation. Let's welcome Dr. Pai. Thanks so much, Ricky, for this introduction. I'm so excited to be here with you all tonight to present some preliminary findings from the Roadmap 101 breakout rooms on PSC symptoms. Next slide, please. So we all know that patient perspectives are critical when providing medical care and in prioritizing key research questions. For example, some of the comments that I'll share tonight highlight the need for future research to understand PSC symptoms. But what are we striving for in these roadmap sessions? Here we aim to share and capture a much deeper understanding of what it's like to live with these PSC symptoms, including the systematic capture, analysis, and publication of the PSC patient voice. We aim to capture words that PSCers use to describe the symptom, the severity of that symptom and its impact on daily life, and the other symptoms that are experienced at the same time. These findings lay the groundwork, identifying some very preliminary concepts and understandings to guide just the first step in the development of a patient-focused, patient-reported outcome measure, or PROM, for PSC. We'll discuss the steps in developing a PROM in more detail tonight, but let's start first with these symptoms. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit more about the Roadmap 101 breakout rooms for those who weren't there. How were these organized and what were the symptoms that we discussed? So last month in our Roadmap 101 breakout rooms, more than 40 PSCers were assigned to rooms to discuss one of their most troublesome symptoms. Our incredible moderators walked us through a defined set of questions and a plethora of valuable information was documented by our note takers. A few preliminary highlights will be shared tonight. We had the opportunity to discuss a number of PSC symptoms in the breakout rooms, as you can see on this slide. We had one room, paritis, where we had a lot of interest but low turnout. We know this is a symptom of concern and we're currently organizing a focus group to collect perspectives from PSCers regarding their itch. And before I begin going into some of these results, I wanna note that while a diagnosis does not define our lives, I'll use the term PSCer throughout this presentation when referring to people living with PSC. Next slide, please. I also wanna say a huge thank you to the PSCers and caregivers who contributed to this important project last month. Across your rooms, a few phrases stood out. First, since my diagnosis, it was apparent across multiple breakout rooms that after their diagnosis, PSCers could look back and attribute some of their past symptoms to PSC. Second, PSC is different. PSCers express the symptoms they've experienced due to their PSC are different from what they experienced before or with other chronic conditions. The words that they use to define and distinguish these symptoms are very powerful. And third, it's a constant reminder. Symptoms themselves have a huge impact, but PSCers in many groups express that one major impact of their symptoms is that they're a constant reminder that they have PSC. Next slide, please. So let's get into each of these breakout rooms and discuss these preliminary findings, starting with PSC fatigue. PSCers use unique words to describe their fatigue, including draining, crushing, overwhelming, skeletal muscular, tingly tired, and unpredictable. Many people living with chronic disease have hidden symptoms or disabilities, and this is the case in PSC as well. One PSCer said, hearing, you're looking great drives me crazy. I wish people would stop telling me that. We hear that all the time. When you tell people you have to go home and take a nap, they say, why, you're totally fine. What's wrong, you look great. It's almost an insult. You're telling me I don't have a problem. PSCers voiced that PSC fatigue is different from the fatigue they experienced before their diagnosis. One PSCer said, 
If you went on a five mile hike, your legs are tired, but you know you can sit down, you can still think clearly and participate socially. This is different with PSC because you've just got nothing left. PSCers also discussed the impact of their fatigue. They report attending fewer social engagements after their diagnosis, and when they do attend, they say they're unable to participate socially. Next slide, please. So next, let's talk about the abdominal pain associated with PSC. The experience with abdominal pain varied across the five PSCers who described their pain in these breakout rooms. Some PSCers described short episodes of sharp, acute pain, like stiletto heels doing a high kick while others described dull discomfort and pressure that lasted for a few hours or a few days. There is still a lot more for us to learn about how abdominal pain manifests in PSC and the ways in which we could distinguish abdominal pain between IBD and PSC in a prom. Next slide, please. Now, in the group on anxiety, depression, and worry, PSCers expressed a number of factors that contribute to their anxiety, including fears of being away from their doctors, the unknown, medical procedures, infections, and costly medical bills. Many PSCers experienced anxiety and depression for the very first time after their PSC diagnosis. One PSCer said, I never suffered from anxiety or worry much. I've been healthy my whole life. Having this disease, learning about it, having all these tests has sent me into the spiral of the worst worry and anxiety. I thought I was going to be checked into a psych ward. That's how bad it was. Anxiety, depression, and worry related to PSC have a profound impact on quality of life. A few examples include that multiple PSCers expressed they avoid traveling altogether or even going on vacation. They also worried they won't be able or be around to care for their children or question whether they should have children at all. In addition, these symptoms never go away fully. One PSCer says that the pain is a daily reminder that I have this. Finally, PSCers find it difficult to discuss their anxiety and depression with others. I quote, it's hard to talk about or even talk to a doctor about. Next slide, please. So next, let's talk about PSC brain fog. PSCers expressed that they could hide many of their symptoms, but brain fog is one that's quite difficult to hide and it has an impact on career longevity and planning. One professional retired early after experiencing brain fog and hepatic encephalopathy. Another PSCer expressed that he's planning ahead for a future business partner to take his place should brain fog become a larger issue in the future. And one PSCer commented on how you can get into a trap in comparing yourself from one day to the next. I quote, I found that you get in a bit of a trap if you're just comparing yourself to the day before. I went months at a time not realizing my brain fog was actually getting quite a bit worse. A potential solution to this was proposed by another PSCer in the brain fog group. This PSCer said that math tests could be used to measure cognitive function. It was fantastic to hear this discussion as these are tools we may consider for future outcome measures. Next slide, please. In the physical weakness group, the moderator asked the PSCers in the room to define physical weakness. And while we each may have our own definition of this term, the young PSCers in this group defined their physical weakness as lightheadedness, dizzy spells, fainting, or disorientation. And I wanna clarify that these PSCers are not experiencing end-stage liver disease. These descriptions are not related to the fragility that we discussed at the time of transplant. Both of these PSCers described their weakness as more severe when other symptoms were present, including fatigue and abdominal pain. And these descriptions taught us that there may be other symptoms that are experienced by PSCers that we just haven't put a name to yet. We'd like to consider future workshops to discuss lightheadedness, dizzy spells, fainting, or disorientation in more depth. Please reach out to us if you've had a similar experience with any of these symptoms. Next slide, please. In the night sweats, insomnia, and sleep disturbance group, the group spent most of their time discussing night sweats. When PSCers experience night sweats, they often describe feeling boiling hot and drenched, and then suddenly and unexpectedly feeling freezing cold and with chills. The severity here seems to differ from the damp brow to soaked sheets. In describing sleep disturbances, PSCers say they sleep well after 6 a.m. in the early morning, but wake up throughout the night and especially around 2 or 3 a.m. 
Some PSEers in the fatigue breakout room also described experiencing sleep disturbances or insomnia, either associated with their fatigue or not. And some PSEers say the amount of sleep they get does not affect their fatigue, while others say it does. And this last point highlights there's still more for us to learn about insomnia and sleep disturbance and how we can best distinguish them from fatigue in a prom. Next slide, please. All three PSCers in this group said that nausea and vomiting is a constant reminder of living with PSC. One PSCer feels nauseous every time they exercise and the frequency has been increasing since diagnosis. Both PSCers who experience vomiting say they feel better after vomiting and express sympathy for a third PSCer who experiences nausea but not vomiting, suggesting in this group that the act of vomiting itself may help to improve the severity of nausea. And it's really hard to distinguish other symptoms and factors that contribute to nausea and vomiting in PSC. So future research should aim to better understand the nausea and vomiting here. Next slide, please. And finally, in our last breakout group, we um, included asymptomatic PSCers to discuss their worry and fear for the future. The PSCers in this group expressed many of the same fears and concerns as those in the anxiety, worry, and depression group. These PSCers expressed the following fears and concerns. I won't be able to stay active. I will develop cancer. I will have severe itching. I will require procedures which are anxiety inducing. I will have a reduced life expectancy. I will miss watching my children and grandchildren grow up. When asked what their hope is for the next five to 10 years, all three PSCers in this group said that they hope they'll have a drug that will slow the progression of PSC. Next slide, please. So these preliminary findings really highlight the need for future research to better understand PSC symptoms, and in particular, the need to continue these important conversations. And we really want to highlight that no one understands the lived experience of these symptoms better than our PSC community. And this was so evident during the 101 breakout rooms. We also know that input from PSCers is crucial at every stage in developing, testing, and validating a patient-reported outcome measure or PROM. Thanks so much to you all again for joining in these conversations last month and tonight for being here and for inviting me into this wonderful community. Next, Dr. Yvonne will highlight some critical steps in developing these PRO tools. Dr. Yvonne is a clinical health psychologist and behavioral scientist who has worked in the field of chronic liver disease for over 15 years. She is a professor of medicine in the UNC Liver Program at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, where she conducts research to lead the development and evaluation of psychosocial interventions to improve chronic liver disease health outcomes. Welcome, Dr. Yvonne. Hi, Ruth Ann. Thank you so much for that introduction. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so back during the 101 roadmap, um, I showed this figure and I spoke very briefly about that the development of a PRO measure must ensure content and empirical validity. Next slide. And so today I'm gonna to take a deeper dive into these aspects of the development process and I'm gonna be focusing on content validity. And then next slide. Bryce is gonna be talking more about the empirical validity of a Piero instrument. Next slide. So I was asked to just cover a little bit of uh, definitions. So a patient reported outcome or Piero is any report of the status of a patient's health condition that comes directly from the patient without interpretation of the patient's response by a clinician or anyone else. And so what that means is that symptoms or any other unobservable concept that's known only to the patient because it's a subjective experience, such as their pain or their fatigue or nausea. These really can only be measured using PRO measures. Next slide. A little bit more about PRO terminology, because um, some of these terms are used interchangeably. So the, a PRO, think of that as the concept domain or outcome of interest that we want to study. And I've listed several here, and I'm going to use abdominal pain as my example. And a PRO, a PRO measure, which is used interchangeably with terms like instrument tool survey, this is the means by which you're gonna collect data about that PRO concept, abdominal pain. So it includes not only the questions, but a lot of other information about the measure. So say, for example, we were gonna use the Promise Belly Pain tool to measure abdominal pain in a clinical trial. 
the PRO measure produces a score and that represents the PRO concept of interest. So we would be having patients responding to the Promise Belly Pain tool. We obtain an abdominal pain total score, um, a score that may change from baseline to end of the trial. And then we aggregate that data um, to give us an, an understanding about how this PRO concept changes over time. In the field of drug development, PRO measures are used in clinical trials to evaluate um, treatment benefits and risks, how those are directly from patients, and these can use, be used later to support claims about a drug for labeling or advertising. So if, a, if we were using the Promise Belly, tool, belly Pain tool in a clinical trial, we might be able to say that drug X decreases participants' abdominal pain. Next slide. So just a little bit about definitions. Um, this term content validity is so incredibly important to the development of a tool. It means that the measure contains items that are going to cover all important aspects of the concept that it is intended to measure, and it needs to be fully representative of the target population's experience. Next slide. I'm going to be talking today about kind of best practices that were put forth by the um, the ISPORT Tax Force report, reports, and there's a part one and a part two. This part one is about how do we go about eliciting information about concepts to develop a new PRO tool. Um, and there's five overarching um, practices here. Number one, determining the context of use. Number two, developing the research protocol. Three, conducting the interviews or focus groups to elicit concepts and information from patients, conducting the qualitative analysis, and then documenting our work. Next slide. So under each of these best practices, there are several steps. So the first one is about determining the context of use. And it's really important to be working with the patients and the clinicians to really understand the pathophysiology of the disease and its effects and symptoms and signs as they relate to PSC. Um, it's very helpful to think about developing kind of a hypothetical disease model about how all kinds of factors how, are related, and some of these could be clinical outcomes, some of these are patient-reported outcomes, but de developing kind of a robust disease model about how things are related. It's also helpful to develop a hypothetical end endpoint model about a particular concept that we might, we might want to study in a trial, so for example, abdominal pain. Um, and we need to be thinking about any subpopulation differences, such as any cultural or language uh, concerns as we develop an instrument. And we're looking to develop a hypothetical conceptual framework about a particular PSC concept. So this is, these are basically kind of, or it's an organizing tool, a preliminary organizing tool based on information that we know thus far. Um, for example, some of the information that Ruthann was just providing um, and things from the scientific literature and information from clinicians and patients. So we're kind of putting together what we know at this time. Next slide. This is a, an example of a hypothetical conceptual framework for abdominal pain in PSC. Um, and so we might, we might anticipate that as we are doing interviews with patients, that patients may start to talk about different types of severity, frequency, qualities of how they experience it, different locations, how it impacts different aspects of life, and how it may, um, it may overlap with comorbidities or IBD symptoms. And so this is just a framework. And as we go through iteratively the, the, the uh, concept elicitation and talking with patients about these, we're going to kind of modify this, this model. But this is maybe kind of based on what we know about a lot of symptoms so far. This is like a good starting point. And then we'll modify this over time. Next slide. So in terms of developing the research protocol, important to define the target sample characteristics. And for clinical trials, um, the target population is everybody living with PSC, but we're looking at, kind of, we're looking at a subpopulation of that target for, for patients who are eligible to participate in clinical trials. And so that's who you would want to be um, interviewing and doing the qualitative interviews with. From there, we make decisions as to whether we're gonna use individual interviews or focus groups to gather information from patients determining the setting and the location. Are we doing this in person or virtually over the phone? And then we're gonna develop the first draft of an interview guide and we're gonna pilot test that and keep revising it until we get it right. And we're gonna rely on talking with patients and colleagues to review that guide until we're really comfortable with its clarity. Next slide. This is an example of one of my prior interview guides. This was for a study we did where we were looking, we wanted to understand patients kind of anticipated benefits of being cured from hepatitis C. 
Um, and so this this document was about three pages long. But here you can see we start off with in, we start off with um, in, uh, in, uh, instructions. We kind of have some warm up questions and building rapport. And then we get into open ended questions. We start asking questions about if you were cured from Hep C, what do you hope would happen? Um, and so we're really trying to get patients to really talk and share their thoughts, feelings, experiences during this time. However, if you don't get kind of everything that you're looking for, you think there's more, we end up going on and we use probes. So uh, we went and probed for, was there anything further about medical or physical benefits, probes for emotional, mental, or psychological. Um, and so this is the kind of um, interview, interview guide that we would be developing to elicit information about patients about particular concepts of interest. Next slide. So in terms of conducting the interviews, um, definitely important to use experienced interviewers. This is a little bit of an art. And we're gonna be recruiting patients and ensuring that participation is from a broad range of that population of patients who do participate in clinical trials. We're going to conduct several rounds of um, interviews to elicit patient descriptions of particular PRO in, uh, concepts of interest. Those interviews are going to be audio recorded and those recordings are then gonna be transcribed verbatim into written documents. Next slide. So analyzing qualitative data is very different than an analyzing quantitative numbers. Those transcripts that we got from the entire interview is gonna be uploaded into a research program. And here is where our coders are gonna read those transcripts line by line and assign code to patient utterances and phrases. So literally our data are not numbers. Our data are patient utterances, phrases, and words from the interview. So we develop a preliminary coding framework and dictionary kind of based on what we would expect based on our interview guide what we expect we're going to get but these are living documents and they're updated as we code patient utterances and where we we sometimes identify new themes that are discovered that we did not anticipate we're also looking to assess concept saturation and what that means is we're doing interviews and when we're not getting any more information about that particular concept from patients and we're hearing kind of the same thing we know that we have we're, we're saturated with understanding the um the intent of that concept next slide this is an example of just one line from a code book i have this was probably had we probably had about 50 codes for this uh for this study you can see the interview questions where we asked um, trying to get at kind of emotional and psychological benefits of being cured. You can see our code name. And so as the coders went through, they coded any utterance where patients were discussing or commenting on aspects of their emotional well-being or their mood. Next slide. And so here, for example, you can see that we had a main theme or main code that was going to be about anticipated emotional and mood benefits. And we knew that would exist because we were asking about that in the guide. But you can see here that we, we have, um, for example, some utterances on the left, not just having, just not having to worry about it anymore would really ease the stress in my life or, well, it would be one less thing I'd have to worry about. And we had a number of these types of utterances. And so we kind of discovered a new sub theme under the larger one that we called worry reduction. And so under here, we were able to summarize how a bunch of patients were experiencing that they were hoping for worry reduction um, when they were cured from hepatitis C. So this is a little bit about how the qualitative work, uh, qualitative analysis works. Next slide. And then we take all of those utterances, we summarize them and very important, I just have to have a, a call out to anybody who might be working on any studies that have qualitative results. We have very, very little information out there about patients with PSC and their lived experience about what it's like to live with PSC or their symptoms. And so we wanna publish this information. Next slide. And then we need to we need to wrap up our work. And so we have to collect all of this information here. A lot of this information is publishable information. So we would move forward with doing that. But also this is kind of the part of the dossier that has to go, that has to be submitted to the sponsor. Uh, I'm sorry, from the sponsor to the FDA and provides that partial support of the content validity of the measure that you might want to use to evaluate a clinical outcome in a trial. So this is very important information to, to track. Next slide. 
So with that information, we've done all of these in interviews. We've had patients talk a lot of you know, in-depth details about a particular concept about sleep disturbance or fatigue or itch. And then once we have a really good sense about how patients with PSC experience a symptom, we then have to move on to making a decision as to whether we then go and look at the existing literature. Is there a PRO that is currently in existence that really maps on perfectly to, to the PSC patient experience? Um, and if not, is there one that maybe needs a little tweaking and we can modify? And if not, if we look at a whole bunch of fatigue measures out there and they don't resonate and map on to what we heard about, about with PSC fatigue, then we're looking to develop a new measure. Next slide. So the second part of the, the ISPOR um, establishing content validity is about how we go about assessing respondent understanding of the draft tool. And there's uh, five best practices here. So first, we're creating a draft PRO instrument based on the findings from the previous study. Uh, we're designing the process, the inter cognitive interview process, conducting those patient interviews. We're then going to make decisions about how we're going to need to revise the instrument, and then we're going to document our work. Next slide. So in terms of creating the instrument, you have to, it's very important to kind of have established establish criteria for selecting good quality survey items. And we're gonna be asking ourselves questions like, you know, did the majority of people that we interviewed say this, have this quality about this concept? Or did the majority, you know, talk about, was there a range of magnitude for severity or frequency? Or these is this item going to get something like that? So we so we want to really be selecting good quality items. Selecting recall period is super important. This is where you're asking the patient, you know, re, report on your abdominal pain, and do we want them to report for the last 24 hours, the last seven days, or the last 30 days? That also is related to mode of administration. How are you going to collect this information from patients? Are we going to ask them, is this going to be an electronic diary and a text, or when they come into clinic and do a paper report? This is also linked to the assessment time frame in the trial. All these things, the recall period, the mode, and assessment have to be married. Um, we can't, you know, you can't ask a 24-hour questionnaire once in six months for a very highly variable um, and high frequent symptom. And you also don't want to ask patients to report with a questionnaire that asks for 30 days if you're asking it every week. So there needs to be really kind of a marriage between the recall, the mode, and the assessment. And you really need to know well how patients are experiencing their symptoms so you can try to map on the assessment on the, on this, on the experience of the symptom. And then experts like Dr. Reeve are going to pay careful attention to designing the rest of the um, instrument with a bunch of these bulleted items here. Next slide. This is just an example of different response scales for itch, for example. So these are currently being used in PSC studies. You can use a visual analog scale where patients just mark a line, an X on the line to describe their itch. You can have a numeric rating scale like um, the one down below where there's a word anchor at zero and 10 and then no words between one and nine. Or you can use something like the 5D itch scale where there are, it's an ordinal scale and there's words for each of the responses. So there's a variety of different types of response scales for PRO measures. Next slide. Designing the interview process. So again, identifying our sample from the target population. And if we're trying to develop a tool that is fit for purpose in the context of a clinical trial, those are the patients that we would need to recruit. We're gonna design the process. We have to train experienced interviewers in cognitive interviewing. This is a different skill than doing the concept elicitation interviews. And we have to train our patients in something called the think out loud approach. And this is where we ask them to verbalize their thoughts out loud as they are reviewing the draft of the instrument. We're asking them to talk out loud so we can really try to evaluate if they understand the intent of everything on the instrument. We're gonna auto record these interviews as well. And then those get transcribed and then we're gonna prepare our results. Next slide. So this is an example of maybe some of the questions during the cognitive interview as the interviewer is trying to better understand what the patient, if the, the patient's comprehension, if we're trying to understand uh, how, they, how they understand instructions, we might ask, can you tell me in your own words what this instruction is asking you to do? And if we wanna know about the recall period, what period of time were you thinking about when you were completing this questionnaire? And if we're trying to understand full coverage and that there's no missing concepts or subconcepts on the, on the survey, what other experiences do you have about fatigue that are not covered on this tool? So very kind of open-ended and also with probes if we're not getting what we want. 
Next, next uh, slide, please. And then making a decision about how we're going to revise. So we have, let's say, imagine we have gone through a bunch of cognitive interviews. This is an inter iterative process where we can be revising the instrument based on the patient feedback that we get. Cognitive, cognitive interviewing has two goals. The first one is to assess patients' understanding of every aspect about the PRO measure and making sure that they understand the intent of the items and all aspects of it. Um, and then evaluating the comprehensiveness of the PRO items to make sure that there's nothing missing from the survey that would um, help, that would uh, change our understanding of, of evaluating this measure. And then this is actually our last opportunity to make, in, to make uh, adjustments to the PRO measure before it goes on for empirical validation. So the goal of the cognitive interviewing is really to get sufficient evidence of no remaining issues, that there's no remaining issues with understanding from the patient's perspective or the comprehensiveness of the, inter, of the, um, the tool. And then of course, we're gonna assess saturation and when no new issues are raised by patients, we can feel that, we, uh, that this is saturated. Next slide, please. And then finally, the work product that you're cre creating is actually something called like an item tracking matrix. And here is where we list out the original. So let's say we wanted to have develop items about pain. Um, we might have an original item measuring pain and the response set and say that item was trying to measure pain severity. When we talk, when we do our cognitive interviews, and if there is things that we understand from patients where their things are ambiguous or cl not clear, uh, we have to document the rationale and the changes after each of our iterative, iterative rounds of cognitive interviews and provide examples of patient quotes why we need to change an item or a response set. And then we end up with the final items, final response scale, that this item is looking to measure pain severity and that the intent of the item is to measure how bad, how severe pain is for patients. And next slide. Okay, and just wrapping up here. So it is this combination of input from the target population that just to help us describe a concept in detail to help us generate survey items, plus evaluation of patient understanding through cognitive interviewing, which is what's required to establish evidence of content validity for a particular measure. It's, we don't really wanna just pick a PRO off the shelf and use it without knowing that we map on the experience of the patient population with the, the, in, the uh, instrument. Um, and so very important that we have a lot of patient engagement that is required to establish content validity um, for a PRO measure for PSD. And I'm going to stop there. Um, and I believe we're gonna, maybe I'm gonna answer some questions in chat, but first I'm going to introduce Bryce. Okay. Uh, so Bryce, Dr. Bryce Reeve is a professor of population health sciences and pediatrics at Duke University, and he's also there the director of the Center for Health Measurement, and he um, has a lot of training in psychometrics. His work focuses on assessing the impact of disease and treatments on the lives of patients and caregivers, and this includes the development of clinical outcome assessments using both qualitative and quantitative methods and the integration of patient-centered data in research and healthcare delivery. In 2015, Bryce was awarded the John Ware from the SF36 and Alvin Tarlov Career Achievement Prize in Patient Reported Outcome Measures. And from 2017 to 19, Bryce was ranked in the top 1% of researchers most cited in his respective field. I've been working with Bryce for, I think, eight or nine years now, and he's a delight, and um, I'll hand things over to him now. Welcome, Bryce. Thank you so much, Donna. Um, that was a wonderful presentation and it will certainly be um, a hard benchmark to pass overall. So thank you for that wonderful introduction. So uh, good evening or good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to be able to chat with you all today about a subject I'm very passionate about, which is trying to make sure that we are capturing uh, what patients deem are the most important outcomes for them um, with the right set of tools. And importantly, as you heard from Donna, um, is that uh, you know the extent that we can capture the patient experiences accurately will make sure that what we're evaluating in our trials are patient-centered. And so my talk will build upon what Donna just uh, uh, discussed um, and will expand and looking at how through qualitative and quantitative methods, we can make sure that the measure we use is an appropriate measure for our research study in PSC populations. You'll notice in the top of 
my screen, uh, this patient value added marker, uh, which builds on what Ruth Ann said there is, you know, the extent that we can involve patients in this process um, will result in good quality work. And that's not just the PRO measure itself, but also how we use that measure in the study. And when we, and when we talk about patient involvement, it's not simply as participants in the study. They could be advisors to the study. They could be co-investigators in the study. And the extent that patients are involved in all levels there, again, will result in high quality work and good findings. Next slide, please. So this is a really nice quote that was uh, written uh, um, originally for outcomes research, uh, cancer outcomes research, but I think applies to many other conditions and diseases, um, in, in particular PSC. And basically what it says is, for our research field to achieve its potential to provide the necessary information and to find the right treatments to treat and manage patients with PSC, then there are at least three prerequisites. And number one, which is bolder because that's the focus for my presentation today, is we need to make sure that we're measuring what we call patient-centered outcomes using highly psychometrically sound, rigorous, and standardized PRO measures. In addition, prerequisite two is we need very thoughtful clinical trials that provide evidence about the impact of these interventions on these key patient-centered outcomes that use these PRO measures. And then thirdly, we need to make sure that as a result of our clinical trials that we have the ability and capacity and ingenuity to make sure we translate these findings from our trials in a rapid way to make sure that information is available to help inform treatment decision-making for our key stakeholders. And those stakeholders are patients, their caregivers, and the clinical population. Next slide, please. Well, what are patient-centered outcomes? I think Donna did a great job of this, as well as Ruth Ann. But obviously, patient-centered outcomes are those outcomes that patients or their advocates deem as most important for them for us to think about when we start to think about what is treatment benefit. And for PSCers, um, you know, there could be a range of important outcomes. Likely the most important outcome is obviously would be a cure or some kind of disease remission, but also they might also identify uh, as Ruth Ann well uh, summarized in her presentation is there are a number of symptoms that they would like to see reduced as well. And I have uh, listed here itching, abdominal pain, fatigue, and jaundice. Now, when we think about measuring these important patient-centered outcomes, we have different sets of tools that help us to measure these things. So for disease remission, we might have to use some type of biomarker to, to, to identify whether the disease has gone away. For, for symptoms like jaundice, we might have some clinicians evaluate the level of jaundice in patients. And then for symptoms like itching, abdominal pain, fatigue, um, there is no argument that the best source of information comes from patients themselves. And so for those some types of symptoms like itching, abdominal pain, and fatigue there, uh, patient poured outcome measures are what we think of as the best standardized ways to collect data in clinical trials across a large range of populations. Next slide, please. So we've talked a lot about patient poured outcome measures. And what I wanna do is talk about what are the qualities we look for in a measure. And it's important to understand these different properties or features of a measure. Um, uh, because they are helpful for us to either identify an existing measure that we may want to use in a research field to measure abdominal pain or fatigue or itch, or we might be in the process of developing a new measure, and these are the same type of qualities we want to look for when we develop it using both qualitative methods, as Donna discussed, as well as quantitative met methods that give us evidence about the reliability, the validity, the interpretability, and respondent burden overall. So again, I'm, I'm going to briefly summarize these things. And again, because these are the key properties you want to look for when using a measure in a research study with PSCers. Next slide, please. One of the first properties we look at in terms of selecting a measure or developing a measure is paying very close attention to this property of what's called reliability. 
And in measurement terms, reliability um, is the extent which our instrument is free of measurement error. Error is bad. Um, so uh, low error means high reliability, low reliability means high error. And it's important to know that every single tool we use in research has some level of error, whether we're using some type of biomarker, an x-ray, um, or a patient port outcome, every single measure has some error. And so our goal as developers, like myself there, is to make sure that we are, have a good measure which has high reliability, at, which reduces the error. A really great definition of, of error, uh, of reliability, excuse me, is the one at the bottom of your screen, which expresses how well patients with true systematic differences, like on itch or abdominal pain, can be distinguished from each other in spite of or after accounting for the presence of measurement error. Next slide, please. Another key important property that you hear thrown around all the time is we need a valid measure, validity, validity, validity. Um, and um, in, in general terms, um, basically validity means is and to what extent does this measure um, measure what it's supposed to darn well measure. Um, and so um, it, it's a very simplistic type of thing. And again, it's thrown around generally, but it's important to note that there are different types of validity. And so when someone says, it's, uh, I have a valid measure here, um, it's important to ask, well, well um, what type, how did you assess validity? What type of validity? Did you assess this validity in the PSC po uh, population or not, or similar populations? Um, and as you'll notice, I have the word extent in quotes here. Um, and that means that validity, you know, once one study does not validate a measure or invalidate a measure, it's always a body of evidence that we're building to help us understand how appropriate this measure is for measuring that, that concept or here or outcome measure of interest. So I'm going to quickly go through the three different types of validity that we often look at when we have to either develop a measure or select a measure for use in research studies. Next slide. The first aspect of validity that I thought well, Don did an excellent job, better than I can do, uh, to summarize uh, content validity is, you know, does, does this measure include those important attributes that make up the measure? Um, and so this information, again, as Donna alluded, comes from our qualitative steps or studies there, like concept elicitation, where we sit down with patients and have them talk about, just like many of you did, to talk about what that symptom is and what are aspects of that symptom that we need to assess. And so my example on the screen is we're looking at the it, symptom of pruritus or itch. And um, this is something that I developed. So if you want to blame anybody for something missing, you can blame me. But I, I thought about itch in terms of its intensity or severity. I also thought about itch in terms of how long it lasts and how frequent it occurs. I also thought about itch in terms of the area. Is it, is it just a small area of the body or does it cover the whole body? And then lastly, I thought about how itch might impact your daily activities, um, going to work, going to school, or just even concentrating or trying to sleep. Um, so all these are important aspects and if these are what we heard from patients through those interviews that Don described, then those are important aspects that if I were to develop a brand new itch measure, and I'll call it Bryce's new itch measure, I would want to make sure that I have questions that tap into each of those four important subdomains of itch. And the extent that my measure captures those things uh, helps support the content validity of the scale. The content validity, because Donna concentrated so much on that, it's important because the FDA is very interested in that property. Next slide, please. Another validity property you'll hear discussed is called criterion reliability. I'm not gonna to spend too much time here because um, basically what it asks is to what extent does this measure that you're looking at compare or associate with a gold standard measure? Now, that all sounds nice and pretty because you know it's, well, of course it wants to uh, uh, associate with a gold standard measure. But oftentimes for subjective symptoms like fatigue and pain um, or abdominal pain, um, you know, there is no outside external gold standard. You know, the patient is what the patient says there. So oftentimes we don't really look at criteria of validity, except for domains, maybe like physical functioning, where you're asking about a person's ability to go up and down stairs, and then you have them maybe do that. Next slide, please. 
The third aspect of validity, and it's a big one, um, is called construct validity. And this has to focus on the quantitative scores that emerge from our PRO measure. And importantly, what the, what the construct validity, when we evaluate it in quantitative or uh, studies where we collect data, empirical data, is the scores must behave in a way that's consistent with our hypothesis or theory based on what we know about the, how this construct like itch or abdominal pain behaves in particular populations like PSC. Now, there are multiple types of construct validity, and I'll quickly go through these things um, in turn there, but again, they're all focused on how well those scores from the measure behave uh, under conditions where we are controlling and should know about exactly what represents high and low scores on this measure. So next slide, please. For structural validity, which is a part of construct validity, is you know, importantly, if I said these four subdomains of itch are important and measure a single domain, then uh, the structural validity asks, you know, to what extent do all those items on severity and frequency and area and impact, to what extent do they form a single construct as we hypothesize, or potentially multiple constructs, separate constructs, which we need to account for. Next slide. Grace, I just wanted to give you a three minute warning. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, convergent validity. Um, so convergent validity asks, okay, if I have Bryce's new itch measure, how well does it associate with other PRO itch measures like that numeric rating scale that Donna presented um, a little while ago? And if I see strong correlations or associate between my measure and an established measure, that supports convergent validity. Next slide. For discriminant validity is how well does my measure uh, have you know, uh, different associations with other established measures that measure different types of constructs. So for example, as I showed you for convergent validity, I had a strong association with another itch measure. The associations with things like pain or sleep should be still associated, but less than what I see with uh, an itch measure. Next slide. Known goose validity means that, you know, if I test my Bryce's new itch measure and I test it in a sample of patients who are experiencing uh, PSCs of high disease activity, and then also test the measure in a sample of patients who are in disease remission and are not experiencing itch, then my measure should be able to distinguish and show that those with high disease activity should have higher scores on my itch than those in remission. Next slide. And of course, because we do clinical trials, when we look at longitudinal research, it's important that our measure looks at change over time. And so um, there are different ways we can test known interventions to see if my measure actually picks up on change over time when we expect change to occur. Next slide. Two last properties we look for in a measure is how well we can interpret the scores. And so the easy example I can show you is if I told you your itch score is a 64, you'd be like, what does that mean? I have no idea. So interpretability is important to help stakeholders recognize what represents a high score versus a low score. Um, what's a meaningful change that represents, from patient's perspective, an improvement in itch as a change over time? So all these things are important for us to understand about the hero measure. Next slide. And then uh, the last important attribute um, is that uh, we need to make sure that we are not overburdening patients with very long questionnaires that, that answer about 50 symptoms with 5,000 questions. We need to keep respondent burned down. In addition, we need to recognize that we had measures that can be easily used by the researchers, that there's not barriers to use a measure, nor additional costs. That's beyond necessary. Next slide, please. So those are the attributes we look for in existing measure or what we use to help guide develop a measure. The last thing I just really wanna note here is we need to be careful about how we select the best measure for whether we're using this in a research study, a clinical trial, or a healthcare delivery study. Next slide. And the important point I wanna make there is that, you know, um, is that the type of measure you might use in a research study may not be the best measure to use in a clinical practice setting to inform decision-making. Um, I've seen attempts to do this. Unfortunately, sometimes they've failed. And so again, if you think about how you want to use this measure will depend on exactly what kind of information you get from the type of study that you're conducting. 
Um, in addition to that, other than just choosing a measure, integrating that in your research study is also an important practice and how you can maximize information at the right time longitudinally, but also minimize missing data. No one wants missing data. And there are two great resources. Um, the Proteus is a great resource uh, for how to use PRO measures in research studies. And then this PCORI guide at the bottom right of my screen provides guides about how to use PRO measures in uh, uh, routine clinical care settings. Next slide. So in conclusion, um, you know, hopefully over this last three sessions, uh, we, um, presentations, we've talked about how important patient port outcome measures are to systematically collect patient port data directly from patients. Um, that there are, in our second bullet, there are standards for what FDA looks for in, in approving appropriate measures for use as outcome measures. In addition, the third bullet is there are good guidances out there about how to use a measure in both research trials to maximize information, minimize missing data. And then most importantly, as I emphasized from the beginning, patient involvement is critical to make sure that we're answering the most important questions as well as design a study that yield the most meaningful results. Thank you very much. So I'd like to give huge thanks to Drs. Pai, Yvonne, and Reeve for their informative presentations. To our moderators for leading the breakout room discussions, to our note takers, and of course, to all of our attendees for sharing your voices on the important topic of PROMS and PSC. We hope you will please join us for our next roadmap webinar. It will be Wednesday, October, I mean August 11th from 6 to 7:30 p.m. Mountain Time. And the topic will be the PSC research landscape now and into the future. Next slide, please. Here are reminders, the slide will come up in a minute, for of upcoming opportunities at PSC Partners. Please save the Boston conference dates. I know Mary mentioned it, June 2nd through 5th of 2022. We finally will be back in person. Um, it'll be a traditional PSC patient caregiver conference with the addition of an international collaborative research network component, bringing together the top international PSC researchers and clinicians. Please join the patient registry if you haven't already. We really would love all PSCers to participate. Visit our links on our website to updated COVID-19 and vaccine information. Please join us in Walk 83.01, our current really fun project to raise funds for PSC research. The fundraiser started July 1st and it runs through September 30th. You can participate individually or as part of a team. Check out the details on our website and join Billy, the cute liver below in his, her running shoes and cap. Sign up for a mailing list and follow us on social media. Check out our future Zoom rooms on the events page of our website to connect with other PSCers or caregivers. PSC patient age, ages 18 and up will be July 14th. PSC spouses, caregivers and parents will be August 17th. For our Canadian participants, please visit your website at pscpartners.ca. Sign up for the mailing list, follow us on social media. Congratulations on last month's wildly successful fundraising auction, Hope is in Our Hands. Our exit survey will show up in your inbox shortly. We really appreciate your feedback and it really helps us plan future webinars. Your opinions are important to us. So thank you again, everyone, for this wonderful webinar. Enjoy summertime. Please stay in touch. And if we can help you with anything, please let us know. Thank you.